This episode of Addressing Gettysburg is brought to you in part by me, audiobook narrator Mike Scott. Narrator of Savas Beattie's Bloody Autumn, the Shenandoah Valley Campaign of 1864, and, unlike anything that ever floated, The Monitor and Virginia and the Battle of Hampton Roads. If you are an author or publisher interested in having your titles produced as audiobooks, or even just in learning more about the process, give me a shout. You can find my contact info on my website, mikescottvoice.com. That's mikescottvoice.com. And Civil War Trails. It's the world's largest open-air museum, and they offer over 1,300 sites across six states. Drive the Gettysburg Campaign turn by turn, paddle to Frederick Douglass's birthplace, or hike to remote earthworks and artillery positions. Visit CivilWarTrails.org to request a brochure and explore their interactive map. Follow Civil War Trails and create some history of your own. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. <laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this episode of Addressing Gettysburg. It's Ask a Gettysburg Guide, and we have a new guide with us today, uh, Mike Rupert, all the way from the Pittsburgh area, correct? Yes, yes. The area or Pittsburgh proper? Pittsburgh proper. Proper. Born and raised. I was actually born in a police ambulance on the way to the hospital. Really? So that's as (laughs) Pittsburgh as they come. (laughs) Um, so, uh, oh, what do we got there? Okay. So, sorry, it's just a little, uh, camera kerfuffle there. Um, so Mike, tell us, uh, you've been a guide, uh, for how long? I've been a guide since October of 2018. Okay. So I'm in my, uh, fourth year and, uh, full time. Basically I'm in the, uh, Pittsburgh or not Pittsburgh area, Gettysburg area from beginning of May to about the end of October. So you're from what the future uh, visitors to Gettysburg and Gettysburg Buffs will uh, will call the last class of yes. guides yes, I ever, am. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, that is uh, that's got to be well. That, what does that feel like to be from the last class ever? Nobody will come after you. <laughs> <laughs> well, eventually somebody's going to have to. No, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> there are some theories out there. It's pretty, uh, oh, oh, I hope not. I <laughs> certainly hope not, okay? Yeah, we all um, hope not, but... Yeah, it, it feels, um, it, it does feel pretty good at being here uh, for multiple years. You kind of get to be more known. You get to know the other guides. You actually learn a lot more because once you have a license, doesn't mean you're done by That's any means. Right. So you have to keep on going. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and yeah, and uh, you learn from other guides, you learn from going on the tours with other guides and giving your own and then getting feedback, I'm sure, right? Absolutely. You, and you, you want feedback. You know? Yeah. If something you say doesn't make sense, you want to know about it. Absolutely. Um, what did you do before you became a guide? <laughs> something I still do. Oh, uh, well, okay. I have been uh, fixing cars for the past uh, 35 years. And I still have, of course, all the licenses and such to uh, work on vehicles here in Pennsylvania. Um, How many licenses do you need to work on vehicles in Pennsylvania? Pennsylvania inspection license, Pennsylvania emission inspection license, Pennsylvania certified repair technician. Um, I do have a motor vehicle damage appraiser's license, but I don't use that because I just do the mechanical repair end of it. Okay. I'm um, certified uh, by Automotive Group, the Automotive Service Excellent. I'm actually a certified master as well as certified advanced level uh, performance for automobiles. So, oh, wow. That is a lot. Yeah. So, and all those things have to be kept up. It's not like right, of course. you get a license, uh, like a, get a guide license, and then, you're, then you, are, you're, you have it forever. But these licenses, you have to continually test and renew every couple years or every five years. Now, uh, you, you have the guide license forever or, or as long as you pay... Well, oh, you have to pay like an yeah, annual fee? Oh, yeah, you do have to yeah. pay an annual fee. So yeah. you don't really have it forever. Because <laughs> what happens if you don't pay the fee? Uh, then you don't get the guide. They're going to take it. They're going to yeah, take it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, well, uh, so <clears throat> what is your, do you have a favorite uh, part of the battle, favorite uh, unit, commander, anything yet? Um, there's probably, I am still all over the place, so I cannot zero it down. Some of my favorite stories are Ira Grover in the 7th Indiana, mm-hmm. late in the day on day one up at the uh, top of Culp's Hill. Um, different stories like that, the way Hancock is going to be all over the place, plugging all those holes throughout the whole Cemetery Ridge fiasco mm-hmm. late afternoon, early evening on day two. So 
there's lots of areas. I haven't set on one yet. Yeah, I have the same problem. I, I don't have like like Eric. He loves the Pennsylvania reserves and I know. and it the bucktail. It is insane how much he knows about I the know. Pennsylvania reserves. I know he I don't loves. Really it. know that much? Oh, Eric, yes, stop it's it! It's insane. You should you should be doing a Pennsylvania reserve show. By the way, that's well, right. We we've we've talked about giving him his own show called okay. Eric and his bucktails and his Pennsylvania <laughs> reserves. He likes the bucktails. He likes the PA reserves. And uh, I envy that uh, people who uh, who can find that thing that they like and really get obsessed. But like I like the whole battle. Mm -hmm. I find it all fascinating. Yeah, I'm on the same page. Yeah, there's a few characters who I find interesting. You know, give me a chuckle or inspire me or whatnot. But uh, yeah, for the most part, uh, I haven't really found that that one thing yet. Yeah, and me neither. Uh, maybe I never will. I don't know. Yeah. Who knows? That's, you know, I'm, I'm a single guy, so maybe there, I have a oh, problem with finding I'm one married. thing. Okay, well, you can find one thing, so you have a, cha you have a chance, but uh, yes. I don't know about me. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget to uh, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Make sure that you have all your notifications turned on. And also, if you use the Apple Podcast app, please leave a five-star review. Reviews, liking, and sharing. Let's emphasize that today. Sharing. Sharing is caring. Weren't we told that as children? I think we were. Um, so share the show. Even if people don't like history, share it. Be obnoxious about it because maybe they'll say, well, what is this that the, this guy keeps sharing or this gal keeps sharing? Let's not forget that. Um, those are the best ways to help us grow our audience. So please uh, lend a hand and do that. Today we are talking about the Bliss Farm. <laughs> Bless you, Eric. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We're talking about the Bliss Farm. Uh, Mike, you did uh, something on it here called Seesaw at the Bliss Farm. Yes. Um, you can open with can that I, can quote. I, yeah, that's a good quote to open with. We send a line of skirmishers down into the meadow among the grass and wheat fields. The enemy push out a rather stronger line from, uh, from their position and crowd our boys back. We put in a few more companies and force them to retrograde movement. And so the line wavers to and fro. That's from the 106th Pennsylvania. Um, lest anybody think that there was an amusement park at the Bliss Farm. Seesaw, you're talking about the action. Yes. The, the, the possession of that property goes from Confederate to Union or Union to Confederate? What, who had it first? The, um, the, the Confederates are going to start to, uh, to, to move down there. And actually late in the day on... Um, on uh, day one, and then uh, the union is going to wind up pushing them out, and that's whenever it starts the morning of day two, back and forth, back and forth. That's what they're going to wind up doing. Um, okay, and so uh, who's the who are the who's the first Confederate unit to the uh, first Confederate units to to go there are going to wind up being um, Alfred Scales uh, Brigade, or I should say, what's left of Alfred Scales Brigade. Right, the whole brigade goes out there. Um, they're going to have, um, I think, only not what's what's left of them is somewhere around 500, we believe, or so, are able to be the uh, the first ones out there, <clears throat> and as they are coming into position. The, you have to remember that throughout the end of the first day, throughout the morning of the second, even until four o'clock, that these battle lines are going to wind up continuing on. So Confederates are going to go all the way down Seminary Ridge, whereas the Union is going to go all the way down Cemetery Ridge. And as they're moving down, this farmstead in between the lines, by the way, let's talk about how far away they are, The um, from the Abraham Bryan farm on Cemetery Ridge, mm -hmm. Union side, the Abraham Bryan barn to the Bliss barn is going to wind up being um, 620 yards. Okay. From the Bliss barn to the uh, West Confederate, of course, West Confederate wasn't there at the time, but that's where the uh, Confederate line is going to be. Seminary Ridge. Yeah, Seminary mm -hmm. Ridge is going to be <clears throat> 570 yards. So, there are, so the farm is almost actually equidistant in between. Mm -hmm. And what winds up being uh, the issue is that th for skirmishers, we'll, we'll talk about skirmishers in a minute, but for skirmishers, they those buildings, especially the barn, which was a citadel or a fortress in itself, was a magnet and just drew the skirmishers to it. Mm. And that's kind of what's going to start that to and fro. Okay. Um, so what happens then? Uh, 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 who'd you say? Uh, Scales' men? Scales' men will be the first Confederates <clears throat> in the area. <clears throat> And as they, um, uh, Scales is going to get decimated by Union artillery as the uh, 
Confederates are making their final assault in the area of the seminary and Lee's headquarters of the Mary Thompson House. They're going to wind up getting uh, caught in crossfire, take severe casualties, but they're going to be the ones who are the first ones on the Bliss property proper, if you will. And um, when does uh, when does the seesaw game begin? And the seesaw, does it? this seesaw game begins right about eh, sometime around eight thirty ish in the morning on day two. Okay, so it's uh, it's going to be uh, fairly early here. Among the first Union men to go out are going to be the uh, the first Delaware, and it's going to be the whole regiment, which is what two hundred and fifty odd men. And this is what we need to describe about what the skirmish line is and the difference between the regular battle line, Mm -hmm. two rows of men, and the skirmish line. Yeah. Because what we have, this this contest, if you will, between opposing skirmish lines, you are going to wind up, by the end of these, by the time the barn and house and barn are finally going to be burned, which is going to be right about lunchtime on day three, you are going to have this back and forth, the to and fro, the seesaw that we talked about. And on both sides, you're going to have more than 2,000 men total from all these different units who are going to take part. So sometimes these guys go out, sometimes those guys go out. And sometimes it gets very muddy. So that's why we say as far as how many times did it really turn hands, probably somewhere around 10. But it's the accounts uh, don't always jive, if you will. Okay, gotcha. Um, so they go. how hard of a fight is it to uh, dislodge the Confederates? Um, initially, uh, it, it doesn't seem to take very much because you need, let's talk about, can we talk about skirmishing? Sure. Yeah. 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 Skirmishing your regular line of battle, the whole purpose, what the infantry is trying to do. And Eric, if I say anything wrong, correct me about this because I'm not a military guy. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Lines, lines of battle. The whole purpose, infantry's purpose is to take and hold ground. The whole idea on how you win a a battle is you drive, I'm going to drive, you have your battle line set up. I have mine set up. I'm going to try to drive you from the field. Right. If I'm trying to drive you from the field, these battle lines are, can, can change. However, okay. whenever you start to have a more stationary position, like they're going to wind up having here on day two, and then throughout, of course, the same battle lines are going to be there on seminary and cemetery ridges for two days there. But you are going to send out skirmishers, and your skirmishers are not solid battle lines. And the general rule that you need to understand about skirmishers is skirmishers cannot take a position, and skirmishers cannot hold a position. It can't hold, nor can it attack. Do you know what I mean? Sure, sure. So they're just going to be out there. They're still your early warning. Right. And so what both sides wind up doing at different times, sometimes it's a bunch of men, sometimes it's not so many men, but that's how they're going to wind up starting this back and forth. And they're going to be using that Bliss Farmstead, especially the uh, the barn, that will describe the barn here. I do have a descri- description of the barn about being a citadel in itself. Um, that comes from... Uh, one of the uh, historians of the 14th Connecticut. But nonetheless, um, that's what it is. It's not a line of battle that's moving forward. It's simply these skirmish lines that keep exchanging, if you will, back and forth. So at first, they're just trying to skirmish possession of the building. Who's going to who's gonna have the Bliss Farm as their forward position, if you will? Uh, uh, by the way, yeah. let, let me say this. The Confederates want it so that they can pick off Union officers and artillerymen from the Bliss Farm that are on that uh, part of Cemetery Ridge. Right. Okay, which is going to be everybody who's around Alexander Hayes' division, including his artillery. And that's kind of one of the biggest reasons why Hayes is going to get annoyed or really miffed about this because once Confederates are in that barn— they're protected, of course. You know, it's a, it's that citadel. So they're going to keep picking off those Union men. And that's why he keeps sending out different uh, forays. Uh-huh. <laughs> I learned a new word today, foray. <laughs> he keeps sending out these forays in order to uh, push those Confederates out. Um, you said there was a brick barn? Yes. Uh, description, this description. The description that I have is from Chaplain Stevens. Chaplain Stevens is one of the historians of the 14th Connecticut, which is going to be in uh, Thomas uh, Smythe's brigade, who's right in that part between the Abraham Bryan farm on Cemetery Ridge and all the way down to Arnold's Battery. Okay. okay. So you've got the 1st Delaware, 12th New Jersey, uh, 108th New York is kind of in the back there, and, of course, the 14th Connecticut. So they're right in the middle of all that. 
Um, and now when you say brick barn, is it uh, like the, the trussel barn where it's brick on one side and wood on the other? Is, isn't it? Uh, yes. It, well, it's actually brick on, on two sides mostly. This is the way that Chaplain Stevens describes it. Okay. All right. He says, one large barn, almost a citadel in itself. It was expensive and elaborately built structure as barns go. And this was very common. 18th or 19th century, the barns are how you made your money. The barns are how you survived. So you're right. going to put a lot more money, care, and resources and construction, if you will, into having that barn do the best that it can for you. And this is going to be the same thing here. That's why the, one of the reasons why uh, William Bliss is going to buy this uh, farmstead. It's 75 feet long and 33 feet wide. It's lower story was 10 feet high, constructed of stone, and the upper story, 16 feet high to the eaves, is made of bricks with a brick wall carried all the way to the gables. The overhang was 10 feet along the entire uh, front of the shelter for, uh, for uh, shelter for the cattle. And then the rear is where the bank is. The bank is on the Confederate side. That's important. So the big doors uh, to the bank barn are on the, uh, the Confederate right. side, okay. not the Union side. The Union side is going to have these, um, these uh, windows with louvers that is going to be that protection for whenever the Confederates are in there. Okay. All right. That makes sense. All right. Um, and it's described. This is still Chaplain Stevens. The upper story, uh, uh, I just said this, wow. Uh, the upper story had several long, narrow slits and windows at each end. It was a paradise for sharpshooters with long range rifles. There you go. So it sounds kind of uh, like if people wanted to get in, in a picture in their head of a barn that's here today. Mm, um, Spangler Farm? I would say close to, actually, I, I thought the McPherson. Barn. McPherson, okay. Yeah, because the McPherson barn has the stone walls yeah. on the ends, and then the other part is mostly wood. So right. I would say it's more similar to that one. Okay, okay. All right, so there. So there's a picture of the barn in your head. And then, of course, there was a house and a couple of other outbuildings there as well. Do we have any description? Just one? Oh, uh, no. I wanted to add, I need to add something about this property. This is, this is another one of those uh, critical things to understand about terrain. you got to remember the terrain decides how armies move, how they set up, and how they fight. Right. And the Bliss Farm had its own terrain features, as well as the, the buildings, but also on the Confederate side, the back side where the big double doors were, they're going to wind up leading to a 10-acre orchard, which would have been peaches and apples at the time. And this orchard winds up being cover for those Confederates, because once they got down to the orchard, they're going to be under cover until they could, of course, rush the barn if they were going to push uh, the Union men out. Okay. And the Confederates, even, even... After this whole farmstead gets burned, about lunchtime on day three, even into day four, the Confederates are still going to be using that same orchard as cover for their skirmishers, if you will, until the whole army winds up pulling out. Okay. So it's even used afterwards. Okay. All right. Um, so that's on July 2nd, right, where, where they start fighting over it? Or is it... When, yeah, when, it's, it's July, it is July yeah. 2nd. It's the morning of the 2nd is whenever they start fighting over it. So uh, does this last all day? Or, or how does it... Uh, yes. Yeah. It's, um, you're going to have your, your various uh, forays. And I don't know how much... I mean, we might touch a little bit in, in, in some of the quotes as far as how much back and forth there really was between the different units. But essentially, you are going to have multiple units from both sides. One side's going to go out. First Delaware is among the first. Whenever the scales men is, is going to push them out, and then the union's going to go back out there. And it's multiple units. For example, you can even look at the uh, where's our our first one here. I cannot remember all the different units. Well, you read the quote from the 106 Pennsylvania. Right. 106 Pennsylvania is going to be on the western side of the Emmitsburg Road in front of the Cadori Farm. Okay. But look how close they are to the Bliss Farm property. And that's what's going to start our whole back and forth. Mm -hmm. Once Delaware gets gets pushed out, he's going to send forward some of the 111th, 139th New York. Who is that? That's George Willard's brigade. So it's different units within Hayes Division who are all kind of masked around. See how they're all masked around yeah, yeah. between the Emmitsburg and Tawnytown Road, kind of where the point is? Yep. So various units. Are, and a lot of times the ones who go forward are going to be uh, volunteers. Who's going to go do this? Hmm. You know? So is it, uh, are they, so like the first Delaware comes back and the 39th and two companies of the 111th go out. Is it just a constant 
uh, flow of Union troops in there into yeah, the it, Bliss Farm? To it's gonna, it's gonna, it's where you start the back and forth. And then the problem is every time the Confederates have that piece of ground, they're going to wind up going into the building, specifically the barn itself, using it as a sharpshooter's nest, and then picking off the Union officers, and especially around the artillery cannons between Arnold and Woodruff, who are facing that way. Mm. That's what these uh, Confederate sharpshooters are going to be shooting at that entire time, okay. whenever they have it. So um, the uh, later in the day on the 2nd mm -hmm. is Longstreet's assault. Yes. And, uh, you know, it, that's supposed to go up the line from Hood's division north all the way up. Mm -hmm. in Anderson. Like, go ahead. Let, let me... Longstreet's assault... Um, Am I jumping ahead too far? No, no, no. Oh, okay. No, I, I just want... I wanted to point something out, maybe make things a little more clear here, because... Anderson's Anderson and Pender, whose divisions are in that area, who are confronting over this uh, Bliss property, if you will, they're going to start to run into problems. Whenever Longstreet's assault first goes off at four o'clock, it's two brigades deep. Do you, okay, so right. you got you got Hoods has a total of four brigades. You got two brigades uh, go off, and then two more come behind it. So there's that uh, attack in depth, if you will. Whenever McLaws comes up, he's going to be next. He sends his two forward, then another two follow him. Once you get to Anderson, there's no second brigade attacking, so it becomes individual, if you will. Because after Barksdale, Barksdale is going to basically push the—he's uh, the one who cracks— Dan Sickles at the corner of the peach mm -hmm. orchard, and he's going to wind up kind of moving up towards Emmitsburg Road. He's going to start going towards uh, Humphrey's division next, who's along that Emmitsburg Road. However, coming behind Barksdale is going to be Wofford's Georgians, and Wofford's Georgians are basically going to go straight past the peach orchard and go into the wheat field fight. Mm. Wofford's Georgians are the ones who eventually clear the wheat field right around 7.30-ish. So the next one up is going to be... Um, Cadmus Wilcox's Alabamians, about 1,700 or so guys. But there's nothing behind them. Okay? Right, okay. So it's not like a double line. Right, right. And so I think that's one of the things that's going to start to begin to take the steam or the punch, if you will, yeah. out of Longstreet's assault on the second day. And right next to uh, Wilcox's Alabamians, further up, going north, is going to be a small brigade of those Floridians, but you only got just over 700, so it's, right, a, it's a small right, one. Right. Then the next guy in line is going to be Ambrose Wright, Rans, Rans Wright's Georgians, and again, it's a single line. And then who's supposed to be sporting them? Posey's Mississippians. And it's Posey's Mississippians who get hung up around the, the Bliss Farm. So that's interesting. So and then and Anderson himself is kind of not really involved. Yes, he's not. Well, you got you got numerous problems with this uh, six uh, attack uh, succession, if you will. You don't want to call it an echelon, but it does kind of move in an echelon fashion, one after the other, boom, 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 up steps or up the rungs of a ladder. Mm -hmm. And once uh, Wilcox goes forward, Wilcox, uh, Alabamians, he's going to get stopped um, mostly by George Willard's brigade because. All of George Willard's brigade is going to get sent down by Hancock here. Right, right. It's going to be Willard who puts the bullets in the Barksdale and is going to stop the Mississippians. Then they're going to turn and fire into the flank of Wilcox's Alabamians. And then you got that big empty spot. Hancock's going to famously order that the first Minnesota stagger the uh, Alabama line. Uh, Florida is going to get hung up by some cannons and some other Union uh, infantry that Hancock's going to throw out to that area. So for those of the people listening whose eyes are going crossed right now from mm -hmm. all that, yeah. Willard's brigade goes down to roughly the area of the PA Memorial. Down past that. A little that. further past south that, of that. Yes. Yeah, oh, yeah, but yeah, just that. to give them a reference point. And they're, they're going to go out um, kind of into that little brush down down along yeah, the, the creek there the, yeah the uh that's called a kadori trossel thicket mm -hmm. plum run begins right around the kadori farm goes all the way down to the uh trossel farm trossel farm however you say it but that scrub growth there yes that's yeah. where they're going to wind up going to get held up okay mississippians get hung up there again attacks from uh willard and of course all the union cannon that are now forming new lines there on that part of cemetery ridge 
And then Wilcox kind of has a chance, but he's going to wind up getting hung up as well. And then next to him, Lang's Floridians are only going to go so far. But the Georgians are a different story. Okay. Uh, one of the, I'm going off into a million directions here. Yeah. So, anyway, thought, so okay. So when you're describing this, when I said to everybody, we go down to Willard, and Willard is a little touch south of the Pennsylvania Memorial, and then Everything you mentioned after that, you're moving north. I'm from moving there. north. Yeah. Yes, I yes. just want people to get an idea in their head okay. if they're not looking at the the Leno book while okay. they're listening. <laughs> okay. Um, so okay. So go ahead now from there. Now the the next uh, brigade who's next to the Floridians is going to be uh, Rand's Wright's Georgians. The Georgians um, have a lot to do. I think um, Lee gives them a lot of uh, credence, if you will, because Wright's Georgians are going to wind up crossing the uh, the Kadori farm. And Wright's Georgians are actually going to make it all the way to the Cemetery Ridge Union defensive line just south of the famous Copse of Trees, okay? And they make it there. They don't break through. They can't stay there. They got to go back. However, think about this. Of all those other Confederate attacks, nobody makes it to Cemetery Ridge proper other than the Georgians. In the evening of day two, General Lee is going to be talking to these guys who the leaders of those attacks. Uh, Ambrose Wright is one of the guys that he talks to, and Wright tells him that he made it to the Union line on Cemetery Ridge there. This is very encouraging to General Lee. Why? If 1,400 Georgians can make it there, Lee believes that part of the Union line is weak. And it was. Why? Because Hancock had to strip all those troops to go into the wheat field fight and, you know, patch all the holes that Sickles made on the lower part of the Cemetery Ridge line. So it was weak. And so Lee believes that part of the Union line is weak. So that's why the next day for Pickett's Charge, that area winds up being the focus, if you will. Um, okay, so then uh, the next day, let's get to the next day. Oh, or is there something else on the no, second yeah, day? Yeah, there's, there's still more. Let's, let's, okay. let's go up to the next one. The next one, and Wright is going to complain about this, by the way. Remember, we didn't have that nobody's coming behind me yes. once you get with uh, Anderson's men. So nobody's coming behind him. But he's supposed to have, Wright is supposed to have support on his left from Posey's Mississippians, who did have the orders to support Wright. Right. However... Posey's Mississippians are going to wind up getting hung up at that Bliss Farm. Remember, it's 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 a it's a comfortable place to be. You got some protection, and only one regiment, the 48th Mississippi, and I think part of the 19th is going to go forward with Wright, and the other guys never go forward. Mm. And then one of the reasons given. or I should say Posey gives that he didn't go forward is because <laughs> Mahone. Mahone's Virginians, who were on his left, never went forward, even mm-hmm. though they were, quote, ordered to by Anderson. And Mahone's going to say that Anderson told him to guard those cannons up on that part of Cemetery Ridge, and Mahone never moves at all. There's one of the great mysteries of this whole battle, because you got a breakdown between the commanders, command and control. Number one, A.P. Hill, who's in charge of these guys. A.P. Hill is absent. I don't think anybody knows where this guy is throughout the whole battle, because... Maybe that's something that uh, now nah, there wouldn't be much of a show there because he's just <laughs> well, there. nobody knows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so forget about that one. But also, Anderson is kind of seems to be more hands off. He's not taking direct control, whereas he should have done that. But the guy who really could have made a difference here would have been uh, William Dorsey Pender. Pender, mm. late in the day on day two, is going to get hit uh, by a piece of exploding artillery shell, puts a gash in his leg, and he winds up getting taken out of the fight. So there's the leadership that could have made these brigades continue to progress upwards, and it just kind of falls apart. Posey half gets stuck at the Bliss Farm, half go with Wright. Mahone does not move at all, and then the Confederate attack on this part of the Union line of Cemetery Ridge is going to peter out. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, Anderson orders Mahone uh, to uh, to go, go ahead. Forward, yes. Originally, his order was to not. Right, to stay with the cannons. And then he sends an aide to go tell Mahone to go. And Mahone's like, no, the general told me yeah, he to flat stay. Out said, he flat out says yeah. no. Yeah. And then he goes, well, I just came from the general, and he said to tell you to go. go. And he goes, no, he told me to stay before, and that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, can you imagine these situations? It's one of those things that would be so cool just to go hear, yeah. hear, hear what the heck's going on. Yeah. There. And 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 then I think I also read somewhere that uh, somebody, I can't remember who it was, but somebody goes back uh, to Anderson and... Uh, 
and sees uh, all his staff just kind of lounging about on the grass like yeah. they're having a picnic. Yeah. And I think the person said, I don't think he ever saw the ground that um, his, oh no, it was in the Sears book. Sears said he probably never saw the ground there, that yeah. his brigades fought over. There's a, there's a disconnect. There's a definite disconnect. Um, much of it is, is really uh, not clear in that whole who's commanding who, but the bottom line is they don't move. And, yeah. And it stops. That's crazy. Okay, what's next then? Uh, on the evening, evening of day two, uh, Posey's Mississippians are going to occupy the Bliss property. Okay. And so then we, as we go into the night there. So a whole brigade? Um, or most of a brigade? I would say most of it. Now, the 48th is going to get chewed up because they went forward with Wright. Okay. Okay. So, of course, Wright is going to have almost 50% casualties in this piece of action that he does, hitting the Cemetery Ridge line uh, very early evening on day two. Um, but most of Posey's just going to be hanging out around the Bliss Farm overnight. And they're also going to be spreading their skirmishers out. Actually, if you go to the, um, the July 3rd map, this is whenever um, Thomas's Georgians are going to be sent uh, down uh, to Long Lane there, if you will. Okay. So this is on, if you're looking in the Leno book, this is the one called Action at the Bliss Farm. For day, day three. For day, day three. three. Yeah. The first one. Yeah. So we can see that Thomas is going to wind up being ordered down. Um, I do, yeah, I just thought of a, uh, <laughs> of a neat situa or a situation. If you notice that uh, where the long lane is, Thomas is in there, uh, Perrin's going to be next to him going up towards the town. Right. But they've got their, um, another skirmish line that's almost in line with the Bliss Farm that you see there. But on the Union side, you have the 8th Ohio, you got some of the 108th New York, and then you're going to have guys from the 11th Corps heading into town on their skirmish line. But I had a, uh, this is kind of a pretty cool thing that happens here. This is in the middle of the night, okay? And this is between um, the Union lines. Uh, this is uh, uh, Colonel Sawyer is the guy who's in charge of the 8th Ohio. So his... All his men, he had a small regiment, only 209 men. So it's a fairly small regiment. But they're all the way up on, on the skirmish line there. And he said, even though, this, this is a quote, this is a, uh, quote here, the, uh, the night passed in relative quietness, which usually happens on Civil War battlefields, relatively quiet. You've got the occasional pot shots that are taken. Mm -hmm. Except for the screams of the wounded that haven't been taken to aid yes, stations. Yes, yes. See, I can't remember all those things. <laughs> Good job, Matt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, along the skirmish line of the 8th Ohio, uh, two Confederates are going to be observed foraging for food. By the way, they're always looking for food. Sure. This, this is a, you can imagine this. This is, was the operating farm at the time. They had all kinds of animals. They had, they had the chickens. They had the livestock. They had uh, the smokehouses and mm. such. So this is mm. all on and around that property. So uh, Lieutenant uh, Thornburg uh, infor informed Colonel Sawyer of the 8th Ohio that, um, they, uh, that after the battle that his men— along the skirmish line, are going to down a rebel soldier that that evening he was actually fighting with four fair-sized hams strung over his shoulders and another with a cheese as big a cheese wheel as big as a grindstone. <laughs> Probably uh, purloined from the uh, Bliss Kitchen and Smokehouse. Nice. Okay? So this is the kind of different things that are going on uh, in between the lines. Sounds like the Blisses ate well. Uh, yes, it seems, as, it seems as they were uh, pretty uh, prosperous. prosperous. Yeah, there. sounds that way. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't touch on the family. Do you want me to touch a little bit about a family who actually was here at this farm at the time of the battle? Sure, go ahead. They do wind up leaving uh, later in the afternoon on day one, so of course they're not there for any of the fighting. But William and Adeline Bliss, uh, they are from uh, upstate New York. Uh, William is, what, 63, and his wife Adeline is 62. And they have um, two daughters living, living with them, Sarah and Francis, who are a little bit older, uh, Sarah 38, Francis 30. And the reason why um, this is kind of interesting, because they did have another daughter who's often got married. She's living somewhere else at this time. But they had lost two children up in New York. And some people surmise that one of the reasons why they came down to Gettysburg, because it's a busy little town, very industrious, if you will. Mm -hmm. He was able to find a decent farmstead. But uh, two of his other kids never made it out of New York. They wound up dying as being... Uh, 
whenever they were little. Oh, okay. So he only has three living kids at this time, and only two are with him. And after this whole mess winds up getting over, um, should we wait on that about the aftermath? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll okay. get to that. Okay. But so okay. So but that's the family there. Yeah, yeah and it's it's a very it's a very healthy farm. Total of about sixty acres. You uh, orchard itself again ten acres between the uh, peach and uh, apple trees. Very nice. Okay. All right, so then um, where do we leave off there? Day three? Um, yeah, the morning, day of day, three. morning of day three. All right, morning of day three. On the morning of day three, the, um, the accounts, or I should say what winds up happening with the um, different units who are, of course, going back and forth, the 12th New Jersey is going to wind up uh, getting the uh, go-ahead to go out there. The problem with the 12th New Jersey and the action of... Um, the morning of uh, day three is that every they're going to go out there at least three times, starting at 7.30 in the morning. They go out, they chase the Confederates out, and this one is, winds up being that uh, whenever the Confederates see them coming, they're going to, of course, take a few shots at them, and they're all going to run out that big uh, bank barn door back to the orchard. Remember, they got a little bit of cover after they leave the farm building, so they got some cover till they get back to Cemetery Ridge. And then whenever the uh, 12th New Jersey goes out, they're going to capture some prisoners. Uh, they're going to have some wounded, and then they're going to gather the prisoners, the wounded, even some of their dead, and get them back to Cemetery Ridge. And they do this at least three times in the morning. Hmm. 12th New Jersey, back and forth, back and forth. Hmm. And then after a while, whenever the 12th comes back to the Union line, what happens? Confederates go back into the barn, <laughs> and they begin picking off the Union men uh, from those positions in the barn. So uh, no one on the Union side is saying maybe we should not only take the farm, but occupy it? Uh, yeah, that's what's that's what's going to... The, the final order that comes is going to wind up going to the 14th Connecticut. Uh. Um, they're going to wind up getting... Uh, they're going to split in two wings, if if you will. And as they are split in these two wings, they're going to wind up being told to hold it. And then eventually uh, there's already some surmising that if you can't hold it, well, do we got permission to burn it? And that came all the way from uh, actually people believe that it was Hancock who said, gave them the okay to do that. Remember, you don't really want to do that. This is a, a northern farm. Thing. Right. You want to try to avoid that. Uh, but then uh, Colonel uh, Smythe, who was in charge of that brigade there, he does eventually wind up saying, okay, that's a possibility, but it's going to be Hayes who's going to ask for the volunteers to deliver the order. Because the first order that goes out is going to go with the last guy, uh, a Seymour. I think it's Lieutenant Seymour who goes out with um, uh, Ellis there because – Moore was to part of the 14th Connecticut was to go out and capture the barn again. Okay, Ellis was to go out and capture the house. Now the house wasn't as good as a fortress as the barn because the house is just a weatherboard house and bullets could pass sure, through there. Sure, sure. So that wasn't as desirable. However, by this time they're using it anyways, and so it's Ellis better than was, nothing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Ellis was ordered to go out there, and as Ellis was was men were going out there. Um, it's, it's said that Lieutenant Seymour got the order from Colonel uh, Smythe that if you can't hold it, then go ahead and burn it. Seymour was kind of tailing behind. He winds up getting shot in the leg. He never makes it out there with Alice. And then Hayes has to get volunteers to have a, um, the message go out to say, just burn the buildings already. Yeah. And uh, Hitchcock is going to be one of them from the 111th. He's going to volunteer to do it. <coughs> As well as uh, Captain Park Postles, the guy who does the crazy horse ride out there. So uh, prior to them deciding to burn it, and while they're sending men out to try to take it, um, does anybody decide to shell it? Uh, Confederates do. Once the uh, Union goes back out there and the uh, 14th Connecticut is kind of hanging out, if you will. Right. And still, the entire time, you got to remember, once the 14th Connecticut is there, they're going to use whatever cover they can to continue to shoot at the Confederates on uh, the Seminary Ridge side of things. Mm -hmm. And, of course, any ones that are hanging around in, in the orchard. Confederate artillery in that area, they're going to wind up stacking up artillery rounds. 
and starts shelling those buildings. A total of, in this one particular piece of action, this, as the story goes, they're going to stack up 10 rounds at each one, and they wanted them to fire them leisurely at these buildings just to let the uh, union men know that we're here and we know you're there right. and we're going to keep doing this to try to keep them at bay, if you will. Okay. So, so make it unattractive for yes. them to go and take it. Right. But yeah. they but they're going to they do they do wind up uh, 14th Connecticut does wind up uh, staying there. So tell us then uh, about the burning of the farm. The burning. Um, I just uh, as, as we are doing this, I'm having like. Uh, other things that 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 are earlier parts of the story that perhaps I should have uh, brought out more about the right. commanders and stuff like that. Okay. Should I say anything about that? Of course, <laughs> sure, if you want to. <laughs> there's there's one quote. Alexander Hayes is uh, from Western PA, so I got to give. Um, no, you got to do Alexander I, I, Hayes. I got to give him a little bit of credit, and I want to find out the. Uh, and he's uh, the division commander. Yes, he's a division commander. He's the third division of Hancock Second Corps. Okay, now. This is one of the. Um, this is whenever the uh, uh, New York and Delaware goes out there about 11 a.m. on day two. Okay. okay? Uh, the way that it's described is another warm morning. Okay, Hayes could see that the New Yorker skirmish line was already in trouble. In addition to the stubborn uh, detachment, rebel detachment had moved into the orchard, so they're firing at the uh, the 39th New York, who was inside that the buildings at the time. And what winds up happening, the trailing of the aides, think about this. Alexander Hayes wants to be seen here. He wants to rally his men. And what he winds up doing, he is going to wind up going out there on that skirmish line himself, the division commander, okay? So all his aides are going to be there behind him. He's got the, the division flag, and he, he rides out there in the meadow, Six, 600 y- yards almost to the barn itself, and he's shouting instructions and encouragement. And as described by Colonel Clinton McDougall of the 111th New York, this is a quote from McDougall. It was the first and the last time I ever saw a division commander with the division flag and staff on the skirmish line, an act <laughs> of superb gallantry. Wow. So you can imagine the, uh, what's the right word here? Balls. Yeah, okay. There you go. <laughs> that Hayes has to do this. Yeah. Okay. He's yeah. exposing himself. He is clearly within uh, uh, sight of any of those other Confederates who would have just been in the orchard there. Because the Confederates kind of hang around that orchard a lot on the other side of the barn. Again, it's that cover. They're going to use it. So that was just one thing. And another thing that I wanted to bring up is this is also in the action. And this winds up being part of the action. Um, I think throughout the entire time, every time the Confederates were there. Okay. Okay. So every time the Confederates are going to be in those slits in the citadel of the Bliss Barn itself, the uh, we have a story here between the um, those Confederates and Andrew Sharpshooters. Now the Andrew Sharpshooters are going to be actually in line of battle with. Uh, Colonel Smythe's brigade there on that part. Again, right. tw- uh, 1st Delaware, 14th Connecticut, 12th New Jersey, that line right there. And the uh, <laughs> sharpshooters are going to kind of come up with a creative way to start picking off these Confederates in the Bliss Barn. Okay. okay. And this is pretty cool. So what happens, uh, I, got, I do have to read some of these quotes here. Okay. And... First company, the Andrew Sharpshooters, are going to wind up perfecting this. And this is described by an officer in the 12th New Jersey who was fairly close to them. These men are going to be armed with very long uh, range rifles with a, a telescopic uh, sights and kind of a tripod rest, if you will. Hmm. They were placed on our main line with the instructions to stop the annoyance. What's the annoyance? It's all those Confederate sharpshooters in the barn. The barn. Right. So... After a time, the Southern sharpshooters became wise to the range of those rifles and the accuracy of the Massachusetts markmen. Marksmen. Several men were seen to fall at the openings of the barn, but the Confederate sh- sharpshooters became more and more cautious. They realized that once they saw the flash of the rifle discharging along Cemetery Ridge, that they should duck out of view. 
and when the ball passed the opening, they would instantly reappear, ready to shoot or to fall back again if they saw a second rifle flash. Andrew sharpshooters, however, are quick learners. This is what they do. To meet these new tactics, they formed themselves into squads or partnerships of three. And whenever the three were ready, with the, ready to fire with the correct aim, number one would fire, and the enemy would instantly retire uh-huh. from the opening. Uh-huh. And then, counting one, two, three, the remaining two partners would fire simultaneously, each at the appointed opening, and the ball from the number one passed through the opening. The enemy re- re- immediately reappeared, but too late to see the flash of the second. <sighs> And rifles yet in time to receive those bullets. So, <laughs> Clever. Alas, how little we thought of human life for, but what was the sake of for the game that they were playing? Yeah. Well, that's pretty clever, though. Yeah, yeah. It's a good idea. So if you ever have to get into uh, some kind of a skirmish, <laughs> folks, make sure you have the buddy system and make sure there's three of you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So, yes. Yeah, so then, uh, so what the sharpshooters, um, what was their designation? They were a company, right? Uh, sh- From yeah, the uh, Massachusetts. Yeah, yeah. First, there was a, uh, and the reason why we called Andrews Sharpshooters, they didn't get absorbed into the first and second U.S. Sharpshooters, which are the organized ones for the Union. Uh, the reason why, if they decided to go with the uh, the federal one, they would lose their money because they became federal units. So the first and second Andrews Sharpshooters wind up st- staying independent, if okay. you will. Okay, gotcha. But they're still part, of course, of the army. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Did I say that right, Eric? <laughs> yeah, more or less. We're good. Okay. We're good. Um, okay. So they. So. The burning story. That's where we were. Okay, the burning. Yes. Let's finish the burning yeah, story. Um, on the burning, I, I kind of uh, s- made it. The burning is actually, it's, it's a multi-step process. Okay. Um, Han- we touched on a little bit. General Hancock, who commands the Corps in that area, ha- ha- General Hayes, who commands the division in that area, have been watching this action for two days already. Okay. okay? Their c- casualties are mounting. Total involved uh, from both sides is going to be over 2,000 men by the time these these two these buildings are burned. Uh, more than 2,000 men on each side are engaged, and casualties for both sides are going to be somewhere around 300. Okay. They're getting tired of these casualties here, and Hayes always knew that he understood that he does have the option to destroy the farmstead and eliminate that nest, if you will, that was so inviting to the uh, Confederates, and it, it seems. From all the back and forth uh, orders that we have, that uh, Colonel Smythe is the first one to give the okay to burn, and that's whenever I talked about Seymour goes out. Whenever the fort, remember New Jersey came back, they went back and forth at least three times in the morning on day three. Whenever they come back, 14th Connecticut's ordered to go out again, and they do. But Seymour, who gets this order kind of at the tail end of it as they're just heading out, he's going to wind up. Um, Getting shot, so the order never goes. If you can't hold it, burn the buildings. Right. So Hayes realizes that this has to um, have another messenger go out, and this is whenever he's looking for volunteers. Who volunteers? Hitchcock from the 111th. Hitchcock is going to gather up some matches, some cartridge papers, and he's going to start making his way out to the uh, farm site. Now, every time they go forward and back from this. Uh, the site, especially the Union, okay, they are going to have a, um, they got to basically run the gauntlet every time. Right, right. So sometimes they're going to try to follow along the fence line. Uh, whenever they go out this time, when the 14th goes out, uh, Hayes is going to tell them, forget trying to follow that. He wants them to scatter. Just all go out at the same time. And then sometimes they're going to go out in a column. Uh, whenever they do the column things, you've got the guys in the front who get hit first, of course. Right. So it's a little, it's a kind of a mix of everything there. I would have just used the cover of the house houses in Colt Park Uh. (laughs) and approached it from the flank. (laughs) Yeah, well, there were skirmishers out there. You you had Thomas's skirmishers, you had parents, uh, South Carolinians, (laughs) and then further up for the Union side, you're going to have the 11th Corps skirmishers. Okay, so that wouldn't have worked. It would not have worked. No, No, they were in those houses. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so then, uh, so yeah, so So Hitchcock, Sergeant Hitchcock goes. Hitchcock does go out. <laughs> Bob just stopped by and waved, and he <laughs> closed the door and almost knocked the whole shed down. Hitchcock right. goes out, and General Hayes thinks that he better send another one with the exact same message. And that's whenever um, Captain uh, 
uh, Park po- uh, James Park Postles of the uh, First Delaware. He's actually on the staff there. He's not feeling too good, kind of sitting off to the side. Nobody else is volunteering to go across. He says that he's going to do it. So he gets his horse, and he's going to make a, uh, a ride out there and deliver this order. So as he goes, starts to go out, this is that the whole thing that he gets his uh, receives the uh, Medal of Honor for is going to be this action of going under heavy fire out to that farmstead and delivering the order to burn the buildings. And as he goes out, uh, he, he realizes that the only way he's going to be able to um, uh, save himself or have a chance, if you will, from all these guys who begin shooting at him, remember, they got the orchard. They got the skirmishers on either side of the farmstead, too. So there's always going to be shots coming mm, in. Mm. As he goes out there, he starts uh, having the horse kind of do um, right out erratically, if you will. And even it's like zigzagging. Zigzagging yeah, okay. all the way out there. And as he goes out, he actually makes it out there. But also, whenever he's in the, uh, the barnyard there, Confederates who would have been in... Uh, Long Lane by this time, Thomas's Georgians are all the way down there. And in fact, some of them have even come out of Long Lane at this time. And in some cases, less than 270 yards away from that position. So he's still receiving fire. The only way he figures that he's going to be able to do this, get the message, is to keep the horse bucking the entire time. So he's got this horse bucking. He's digging the spurs into the side, holding the reins back. So the horse is doing this whole thing. He delivers the order. And as he delivers the order, He's going to want, once it's acknowledged that it's received, okay, uh, Major uh, Ellis receives the order, he got to get back. Yeah. And so what he does, he's still got the, hers, the spurs digging into the back of the horse. He lets go of the reins, and then the horse is going to shoot out like a bullet towards Cemetery Ridge. Once he gets far enough away, more than 300 yards away, famously, he's going to take off his cap. He's going to doff his cap to them. and then To the Confederates. The, yes, yeah. to the Confederates. And, you know, they do their little cheer or whatever it is. That's crazy. <laughs> I mean, that's the insanity of war, though, right? Like, Yeah, do things like that. Yeah, and then people cheer you when they, if they're just trying to kill you mm-hmm. but then you make it and you wave your hat and they cheer for you yeah it's nuts it makes no sense and one of the things about so many of the different accounts here between the back and forth that whole to and fro uh, action over these two days some of the accounts are muddled and the citation for uh postal's uh medal of honor says that this happened on the second okay now john archer has gone back and forth, but he's kind of sticking with the uh, the third. Uh, Woody Christ also agrees with the third. The third seems to make the most sense because they're talking about the burning. The barn didn't burn mm. until the third, yeah. so that would make much more sense. But it's also believed that Hitchcock of the 111th New York and uh, Apostles, the staff officer from the first Del- for first Delaware, they make it out there about the same time. Okay. Now, d- d- am I remembering this correctly that Hitchcock crawled? I imagine he would have crawled in some of those places. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So he didn't just make yeah. a mad dash for it. Like he got right. out there he's carefully. Gonna try, he's going to try to find cover where he can. Yeah. And uh, think about this too. There was there was kind of there was kind of a safe point, if you will. Uh-huh. Uh, the safe point is going to be the Emmitsburg Road. And I, di- I didn't bring this up. And the reason why I want to uh, touch on this is because whenever we have the Union and Confederate skirmish lines going back and forth, if you will, the orchard on the Confederate side of the barn is going to act as their safe place, if you will. Okay. The Emmitsburg Road is a safe place for the Union, and that's where they even had their skirmish reserve set up, if you will. And the reason why it was a safe place is because the uh, it's all flattened out today, but at the time of the battle, there were some berms along the Emmitsburg Road that were three, four feet high. Okay. okay? So you could go from the Bryan Barn down to the Emmitsburg Road, kind of catch your breath, if, breath, if you will, uh-huh. figure out how you're going to approach that farmstead and then make a dash oh, for okay. it. So, so it that's not the way it is today yeah, at yeah, all. Right. It's it's wide open. Yeah. Okay. So that's important to understand that the skirmish reserve for the Union Army is going to be in that Emmitsburg Road, in those areas where the road, of course, is cuts into the... Uh, so it's kind of like a little further down around the area of the Kadori Barn. It's kind of like that. There's a berm on the west side of the road. 
Yeah. Is that what you're talking yeah. about? Like the, that, where you have then, to go up? Right. And don't forget where the area that, that we're talking about uh, from the Bryan Barn down to the Emmitsburg Road, you had the hotel was there. That road was, uh, those uh, embankments were taken out long ago. Right. But the earliest photographs, when, especially whenever they did the, um, uh, were taking pictures of uh, whenever they were doing the cemetery, you can see those berms in the background on the Emmitsburg Road. And it's it's significant. Okay. So. Okay. Very good. Um, so it burns, and then Pickett's charge occurs. Oh, wait. oh well. there's more. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Um, the other thing that's going to happen is that every time these, especially the, the union, um, every time they go back and forth from that farmstead, they're always going to have or seem to take the time to gather up wounded. Okay. Mm. As well as maybe gather up things that they want to take from the farm, okay? Sure. One of the uh, incidents that I want to bring out while the 14th Connecticut finally gets the okay to uh, torch the buildings, as they begin doing that, we still have a bunch of other guys from the uh, 14th Connecticut who um, wind up uh, chasing some uh, chickens, if you will, in the barnyard. Well, you got to eat. Yeah, you got to eat. However, uh, Chaplain Stevens uh, relates a story that is absolutely one of my favorite stories here. And this is as they're setting the place on fire, okay? Also, at the same time, some of the men of the 14th Connecticut are still sparring off against uh, Thomas's Georgians who were in the Long mm-hmm. Lane area. Even Perrin's men, a little bit further up Long Lane, also had a beat on them as well. So as they're trying to get out of there, gather their wounded, some guys are going to be looking for food, if you will. Okay, and let me find the um, let me find the uh, the food part. Okay. Ah, yes. In fact, <laughs> Chaplain Stephen ca- calls it a culinary episode. <laughs> 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 and these this is quoted from uh, Chaplain uh, Stevens of the Fourteenth Connecticut. One bit of culinary enterprise is interesting. During this time, several men of one group deserves chronicling as a. Uh, as picturing a bit of soldier life and demonstrating the perfectness of military and moral discipline in, ex, that existed in our 14th Connecticut. That group gave undivided attention to endeavor of fire in water to reduce the flesh of a veteran fowl into a pot. Okay? <laughs> that fowl, a little before this, was boldly bossing his little company in the barnyard of Mr. Bliss. <laughs> Sergeant uh, Forrest coveted this bird, his mouth moist with the thought of the delicious dish that it was evidently created for. But as he was too conscientious and too soldierly to lay any hands on it, until unquestioned authority was acquired. He approached the adjutant Doton and gravely requested permission to take the fowl under his protection. The adjutant sympathized with the man and the bird, with the man and the bird, and thought that they should be friends. So he encouraged the alliance. Amid the crack of rifles and the banging of artillery, the sergeant pursued his game until victorious, and he bore him under his arm back to the ridge unharmed. So getting wounded guys out, still firing. He got to get this chicken. Got to get the chicken. So did he eat the chicken? Oh yeah, they're gonna make it once they get Please. back. Uh, I would hope so. I hope so. I was afraid that he actually made friends with it. <laughs> I was like oh, no, don't eat that damn that. thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because that's. I mean, that's a that's a thing though that really did uh, confront these guys is that not all of them had enough food during Absolutely. the battle. Right. They, and we're here at the third day. Also keep in mind, typically whenever an army knows that it's going to be going into battle and they're able to do it, they're going to try to give the guys three days rations, which means you get all, all three days of food all at the same time. Now, the men often are going to wind up eat it all, eat it all up right. as soon as they get it. Right. So here we are two days later. Wow, you know, and not every, not all of them got three days rations, from what I understand. No, Is that right? no, it's it's going to vary. Yeah, it's going to depend on where they were, who had what's available. Oh yeah, yeah. it's going to vary. Uh, okay, so it's burning. Mm-hmm. Pickett's charge takes place. Yes. Um, who who who's the Confederate brigade that goes over the burning property of the Bliss Farm? The the ones who are actually. Uh, Davis's Mississippians do go around it to the north or to the left of the Mississippians is going to be uh, 
uh, Brock and Browse Virginians. Uh-huh. Okay, they're the ones who are on the end. And Brock and Browse Virginians, um, they're the ones who actually cleared the uh, Union uh, Bucktail Brigade, if you will, off of the McPherson farm on day one. That's the Virgin- Brock and Browse Virginians who do that. Right. So here they are. They're now participating in Pickett's Charge as well. Uh, the Virginians uh, do have... A little bit of uh, command and control. They don't have a good relationship with their, um, John Brockenbrow. So they're, they're a little bit shaky, if you will. And whenever they start to go forward for Pickett's Charge, they're going to wind up getting held up by the skirmishers, uh, especially of the 8th Ohio. Some of those, uh, I think the 108th New York, 136th New York, some of the other, um, even 11th Corps uh skirmish lines are going to wind up sending fire into uh, those Virginians, and they kind of only go halfway across the field, if you will. Maybe just as far as the Bliss Farm, maybe a little bit past, and then the Virginians fall back. Okay. Davis's Mississippians are going to go all the way up. We know this. They're going to wind up getting to the Abraham Bryan Farm before they finally are going to get stopped. Um, Okay. So after the battle... Mm -hmm. Um, and everybody returns to see what's left of their homes. What do the Bliss family, what does the Bliss family find? The Bliss, uh, the, everything is gone. And the uh, Bliss family, uh, William, Adeline, Sarah Francis, they wind up leaving sometime in the afternoon on day one. We believe they went somewhere around the uh, the Jacob Weikert farm off the Tawny Town Road on the other side of Little Round. Seems like Pop. a lot of people went there. I know. Yeah. Isn't that weird? Yeah. In, in fact, what was the big deal about that place? I don't know. Did everybody know Jacob Weikert? I don't. Well, let me say this too. Okay. It could be part of confusion because I will say this about um, this battlefield and one of the things that you know, whenever you first start studying, you know, you want to know all the different farms and right. once you look at all the Weikerts and all the Spanglers. Okay. There's nothing left. <laughs> well, <laughs> you have to, to keep track of who's married to who. Yeah. Forget it. You're going to yeah. go insane. I know. And so maybe just you, whoever said, oh, they went to the Weikert farm down there. Well, maybe it was who knows what Weikert. Could have been it George was. or John. Or any of the ones back yeah. there. So, yeah. Okay. So we don't, maybe we don't really know. So we assume it was the Jacob Weikert we farm. Assume. Yeah. Because that seems to be... Wasn't there a hospital there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There, everybody's yeah. going to wind so, up. Right. It seems hospital. like, but it's and right the, on the road. It's right in the Tony Town Road. And also the uh, the George Weikert farm that was actually part of the Cemetery Ridge Line. That's too close to the to the uh, to the actual. Yeah. So. But not on day one. Day one, you wouldn't know. Not that. on day one. Would they, so maybe, you could go maybe to that moved one. To two Weikert farms. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> day one, they go to George, and then by the time day two comes along, they're like, get, get the hell out of yes. here. We'll go to Jacob. Yeah. Could All right. Be. That's still a little too close for comfort, though. The Jacob Weikert yeah, farm is not far. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because closer to the, the round top, some of the shots, and I think some of the shots did wind up going in the yard. Sure. Yeah. All right. So uh, they they return to find everything is gone, mm-hmm. uh, burnt to the ground. Do they receive anything? They do not. They're gonna and uh, William and Adeline and even um, even all the way down to uh, Francis. Francis lives the longest. Uh, she was the youngest uh, daughter there. They file the claims with the U.S. government. You know, just like most people, they're not going to wind up uh, getting anything. Then a little bit later, there's something that's formed in Pennsylvania for, you know, war damages and that sort of thing. Pennsylvania winds up approving it. And then Pennsylvania then says no. Then it goes back to the federal. And then eventually, it seems, as far as we could tell, they're going to get absolutely nothing. Which, that's amazing to me because it was a union officer who ordered it burned. Right, right. So what was the defense? Because Confederates were in it? Yeah, because Confederates caused the uh, damage or were part (laughs) and parcel of the damage. Well, But you didn't have to burn it. So true, yeah, true. So uh, that government. that gets a little bit muddy. However, I, I, I'll say this: um, there's one thing that um, William Bliss is going to say, and this is uh, reported in the Gettysburg Star and Banner uh, after the war. I think it's a it's a pretty decent quote from the newspaper. Okay. Um, the old man and his wife and two daughters were turned out with nothing but the clothes that they had on. Everything was destroyed by fire in those buildings. His fences, cattle, crops were swept away by the battle, leaving him with the bare land for which he was obliged to sacrifice in order to support his family. Nicholas Cadori winds up buying it for $1,000 a little bit later, those 60 acres. Okay. 
He was utterly ruined, but such was his patriotic love for his country that looking on the wreck of all his early possessions, he exclaimed, Let it go, for if I had 20 farms, I would give them all for such a victory. Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. I don't believe anybody. Like who, uh, nobody loves this country that much. I don't know. It's your whole life just taken away from you like that. Nobody loves this country that much. Yeah. I don't care what they he say. He does go back to New York. Um, they do wind up uh, being on hard times. Uh, Francis is going to wind up living until 1921. Okay. And as far as we know... That's the youngest daughter? Yes, yeah. the youngest daughter. She okay. was 30 at the time. Um, she, We have no record of her receiving anything. Hmm. Hmm. Um. What happens to the property after that? Kadori buys it, you said, for $1,000. Um, mm-hmm. What's kind of the, the history of the Be- property? Before we leave the battle, can I do one more thing? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, a little bit of the aftermath. Uh, I think a lot of times we we kind of uh, gloss over this. Yeah, they just buried the dead and boom, it's over. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, George Meade is going to be left with um, the task. He's the victor here. He's going to be left with the task of cleaning up the field. Got to clean up all the busted equipment, unexploded ordnance everywhere, and especially do what? Bury the dead. Okay. Those dead are going to have to be buried all over this battlefield on all these uh, farmers' land. And the, uh, there was a, uh, a Captain uh, Brown in the uh, 12th New Jersey. And he has an account of, uh, they were, of course, burial detail, which would have been out in that area along the Emmitsburg Road, close, close be- out between the lines, if you will. And this is a quote from him. Um, could, could I read this? I think it's pretty yeah, good. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. This is Captain Brown, 12th, New Jersey, after the battle. This is on Sunday, July 5th. Okay. On Sunday, we were all ordered out to bury the dead and help get the wounded off. So think about that. July 5th, you still got wounded men out there. God, yeah, yeah. We found a few living as they had laid out there since Friday afternoon in the broiling sun and in the rain of Saturday. The, gro- the ground here is very hard, full of rocks and stones, and the digging is very laborious work. The dead are many. The time is short, so they got but very shallow graves. In fact, most of them were buried in trenches, not dug over 18 inches deep, and as near as to where they fell as was possible, so as not to have to carry them far. Hmm. Saw one man who had died with his arm in such a position that it stuck up when it was, he was put in the hole. A man took a shovel, struck it a blow, breaking the arm so that it fell. Jesus. And this was done to save as having so much dirt to throw. I remonstrated him with him, and he said the man was dead and it would make no difference to him. And then there was another man who had been wounded in a dozen places, still breathing. One shot had gone clean through his head, striking the temple on one side and coming out the other temple. Wow. And he laid there just breathing. He would gradually stretch out his hand, feel around till he got something between his fingers, whether grass or dirt, it didn't matter. And then he would gradually raise his hand to his head and try to poke the stuff into the wound. Mm. We expected him to die at any moment, so we dug a grave for him. Wow, that's horrifying. And that's, um, I think it's one of the more moving things. Um, I kind of have to, it's it's heart-wrenching. It's one of those things that you kind of try to separate yourself from, but it's real. Yeah. It's real. If only he knew about infection. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> you are something else, bud. <laughs> oh, that, that was a really heavy thing. I had to lighten the mood. <laughs> wow. That is, that is, that. I mean, that's horrible. That's out of a horror movie, though. I mean, to, yeah. to see a guy with that wound and he's still able to think and do something yeah. and coordinate, but he's not really there. That's mm. creepy. That's, that's yeah. frightening. Um, any more on that or no? Okay. Yeah, that's no that. more horrifying stories uh, for the children <laughs> <No>. <laughs> in the audience. Okay, all right. So now, how how does uh, this property fare over the next say hundred years? What does it become? Okay, the um, the Gettysburg Battlefield, uh, pretty cool history. Battlefield is its own history, if you will. 
uh, very early on. It's the people who lived here recognize the importance of preserving it. It's uh, the battlefield itself as a memorial. They formed the first association, uh, 1864, before the war is even over. After the war is over, veterans come back. They take over the association. Then in 1895, um, an act of Congress will create the Gettysburg National Military Park. Whenever that happens, War Department takes over. The War Department is going to be in charge of this battlefield from 1895 until 1933 when the Park Service takes over. Now, War Department is going to do some things here. First of all, the Bliss Farm site that we know today um, had numerous, numerous things uh, on the ground. Uh, Some things we can discern here today, some things we cannot as far as where things necessarily were. But the first thing that's going to interrupt the uh, Bliss Farm site is going to be the Gettysburg and Harrisburg Railroad that actually runs through the property in 1884. And it's it's going to wind up crossing Stevens Run, or I should say the Bliss Farm site, that 60 acres is where the beginning of Stevens Run is. Okay. Okay. And it runs north towards town. And... One of the uh, lines that they would cross, there's kind of between the Emmitsburg Road, the ground kind of rises up, goes down to Stevens Run, and then the Bliss Farm is kind of on a plateau there. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So down by Stevens Run, this uh, Gettysburg and Harrisburg Railroad is going to cut on the um, Emmitsburg Road side of Stevens Run as it goes past the property uh, proper, if you will. Okay. So that's going to be the first major incursion. In fact, whenever so you... So basically right along the, the road is what you're saying? Almost. It eventually is going to go across the Emmitsburg Road, too. It does cross the Emmitsburg Road. Yeah. That's... I can't imagine. I, I know. can't picture that. Weird? that. Yeah. It's very weird. <laughs> so... But you can see this... You can see the, uh, the tracks or the trace of the railroad bed on Google Maps. I mean, Can you? Yeah, it's 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 right there. It's I gotta look cool. it up. No, we'll look it. Okay. It <laughs> yeah. Okay. Keep going. All right, and then the, the uh, next big thing, probably one of the biggest things that's going to wind up affecting the Bliss Farm site, is going to be in 1913. Whenever we had the 50th anniversary of the battle, there was a massive encampment set up there, um, hundreds and hundreds of tents. They even made uh, streets, if you will, out of gravel. And there's going to be about 57,000 people there for that 50th anniversary of the battle. And that's all going to be around the, uh, the Bliss Farm property. And then again, 1917, mostly 1918, they're going to form a uh, training camp there. We called it Camp Colt. And the, by the way, U.S. Army is in charge. Remember, the U.S. Army is also in charge in the 1913 one. And in 19... Uh, 1718, they set up this training camp for tanks. Oh, look at that. Okay. There you go. Now, that view, that view that you see right there, you are looking directly north. The uh, the bank of... Uh, now, this is a... Uh, that's the bank to the okay. barn, right? Yes, that's the bank to the barn. Where you see the monument, that's where the actual barn was. Okay, so right. the barn's going to be right there. The tank is coming up over the side of the uh, <laughs> the bank barn. That's not actually the way the, that would not right. have been to the second yeah, floor. Yeah, you would you would go if you're looking at the picture. You would go from left to right, yes. up, up to the top of that. Yes, ramp. yes. So we had the tra- the tank training here, and that's whenever uh, Dwight Eisenhower is going to be put in charge of the uh, of the uh, tanks there. And all that stuff. Wait, go back, Eric, real quick. All that uh, in the background there, you see nothing but uh, wide open space. Base, but right now, it's people's neighborhoods. People live in homes yes, there. That's Colt yeah. Park. Yeah, you, you look in the distance there, and the, just in that first line, that's where Colt Park is today. But at the time of the battle, that's where Colt Park is just open farmer's fields. And, and this here uh, in the far left background, is that uh, the college? What is that uh, steeple looking thing there? Like yeah. What, I, I can't. What's the name that. of that building, Eric? Do you remember? Is that Gladfelder Hall? I, uh, oh, the one that looks like a Gothic tower. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, right yeah, there. yeah. 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 Is that it? Yeah, that, that that's Gladfelder Hall on the college campus. There. Yeah. Okay. So so that's uh, that's pretty cool to look at that. And it would be that in that time that Eisenhower um, falls in love with this place. He likes the town. He likes the um, the uh, the ground. He likes the battlefield. There and he eventually, is. he does wind up, of course, buying his only home. A home that he ever owns in 1950 on the other side of uh, West Confederate. Look at that goofy looking tank. They have come a long yeah. way, baby. Yeah, those yeah. are French Renaults. Yeah. Oh, is that what those are? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Mm-mm. And there was only one here. But at its peak, there are going to be 8,000 soldiers here training, okay, for mm-hmm. World War One. Now, there were two, still two more things that wind up getting set up on this Bliss Farm property. And even though... 
the uh, War Department is no longer in charge in 1938. The, uh, the Third Army Corps, or the U.S. Army, is going to wind up having a uh, training camp in the same area. Um, that's one of the other pictures. I don't know where it's at, but there was another. Uh, oh, there it is. Look there at that. There you go. This is not the anniversary. This is not part of anything. This is something else extra that the U.S. Army had done in uh, 1938. This photograph comes from the uh, Army uh, Heritage Center up in Carlisle. So it just shows you. To the right-hand side is going to be the Kadori Farm, and you're looking at the Emmitsburg Road to the right. And then as you see all those tents set up, it just goes to show you that the U.S. Army— uh, they needed space, and they're going to wind up using it, and that's exactly what they do. This is fascinating to look at this picture because you got. Um, oh, you can see the railroad. There's, the, see the railroad there? No, where? The, up at the top. See how it comes angling down? Here? Yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, that's, yeah. That's the, all right. Then that's what I was looking. I was looking at it on uh, Google Maps or Google Earth, and, yeah. and I found that there. But um, yeah, there you go, Eric. Good. That's good. Zoom in on that. So look. So you got the Bryan Farm in the upper right. Yep, you got it. Um, um, and then, look, is this where the Bliss Farm would have been? No, the uh, Bliss Farm that? would have been probably where they have that open area right there. See how there's yeah, nothing in that one spot? Right right yeah. Top left? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I would say between between that whole area. See that windy road that cuts in between? Yeah, right here? Uh, yeah, I'd say the Bliss Farm is going to be in that area there. So, kind of hard to see. But but if you if you look, there's a lot of smoke here in this little clump of trees. So it's, it's kind of like <laughs> the Bliss Farm's still on fire, but it's not actually the Bliss Farm. <laughs> um, okay, and then you got the Kodori Barn down here. Right. In the bottom right. Um, what is this one here? Okay, you just... You just yeah, yeah. yeah, I just, yeah okay. so that's 1938. And um, is this Pickett's Buffet? Um... <laughs> That's about where it's located. Yeah, it's about where <laughs> yeah. it is, right? Um, but yeah, no Colt Park. Look at that. So that's mm -hmm. so cool because we don't we don't know none of us alive today and know it, what this looks like without trees or houses. Right to, to, now, look at that that background there where you just said Colt Park is, is located today. Yep. Look at that. That's that broad open uh, plain, if you will. So you're going to have Union skirmishers come out from where we see the Emmitsburg Road. They're going to go out a few hundred yards, and they're going to be sparring off against the Confederates on the Seminary Ridge tree line as well. So that's kind of like the uh, the no man's land. Right. And, and both sides are going to wind up having, you know, severe casualties along this skirmish line that would have been out there. Wow, that's pretty cool. And yeah, you could see the railroad just cutting right yep, across there. There you go. Wow. Yeah, and actually, you can see some cars on it as well. Yep, the, yep. On the, yeah. on the tracks. Maybe it's a steam engine with that smoke. I don't know. Oh, maybe. Oh, yeah, maybe it is. Yeah, there they are. There's some cars there. And then you got... Now, Now, where was the swimming pool? Is this the swimming pool that I'm looking at? Um, it looks like it. I don't know. Um, so if you look at the Emmitsburg Road, about the middle of the photo, just to the right, you see like two rectangles. Yeah, one I has think, a shadow under I, it, which I is like a the pavilion. the one on the left might actually be yeah. a pool. That looks like a pool to me. And that's about where people say that. It, although uh, someone else told me it was down here, closer to the Kodori barn. Yeah, but, I heard yeah. around Kodori, but I have I really have no idea. But if you say that Kodori bought the Bliss Farm, did he buy this property too at one point? Is that would that um, have been Kodori that's, property? That's the, that's getting close to the area where. Um, where Pickett's Charge actually breaks through, is it right. not? Yeah. yeah, yeah. This, this is that the angle's yeah. right over yeah, here. Yeah, the so angle's, this is, the look, angle's right the there. That's the Bryan Farm there. So that would have been um, at the time of the battle. That's the Peter Fry Farm on that side, right there, because we're um, now. The, that's one of the things. You know, if somebody wants to do a work. What we need to do is have somebody do a detailed work on exactly who owned what in July 1863. Yes, <laughs> yes that would be nice. That'd be very helpful. I'm sure Tim Smith has done that, uh, or knows it if he does. If he hasn't yeah, he done it, he probably knows it, but uh, certainly not in any clear, concise book form. Yeah, that's definitely a pool. That looks like, or, or no, no, no. Now it, it looks, looks like, like a tent. tent. Yeah. Well, that rectangle <laughs> to the right is definitely a tent. Yeah, but look, you know what it is, Eric? I'll, the one to the right has the flaps up. The one on the left has them down. Oh, that's fair. See, look, yeah. look closely. You see yeah, the yeah. angle. Yeah. Okay. So that's not the pool. No. Look at that. We've we've debunked our own theory uh, <laughs> within go, five go, minutes. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So that's, that's cool. 1938. Okay. okay that this camp was here, okay. but it still wasn't over yet. We got World War II coming up. And in the same area where uh, these uh, forays back and forth across the Bliss Farm and in the area of the um, 
uh, close to where the uh, home sweet home motel was at the time off the Emmitsburg Road. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a German uh, prisoner of war camp set up in 1944, and it's going to hold about uh, 500 prisoners at its uh, max. We don't have pictures of that, too. That I couldn't no. find. No, not anything top that, secret. That, that legitimately yeah. said Gettysburg. I saw I saw a drawing of that once, but I don't have anything like that yeah. with me. Now, have you heard that a lot of the, the POWs, when the war was over, they're like, uh, I think I want to stay around here. Uh, yeah. Have I you heard that? that? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, there was wonder... actually a, an escape attempt. The yes. last escape attempt in, in 46. Yeah. The, the guy uh, didn't want to have to be repatriated <laughs> to Germany. No, uh, I presumably because where he was from uh, was under Soviet control at that point. Oh, oh I don't blame him. Yeah, I yeah. wouldn't want to go either. I'd want to stay here. <clears throat> Do we know if he did stay? I'm not entirely sure. Okay. I didn't get that far. Is that the one where, where they caught him uh, escaping out of the culvert through the mm, pipe? I don't think that's the same guy. Oh, okay. So there's there's a couple of escapes. Yeah, there I were guess. a handful yeah. of escape attempts. Listen, I don't blame them for wanting to stay here. Yeah. I moved here from New Jersey, which is very much like the Soviet Union. So I understand. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> um, okay. So what else now? Uh, the POW camp. And then after that, it just kind of be, starts to become what we know yes, of it's, today. And then it gets to what we see today. Yeah. Um, if there was one point, I don't remember the year, that the—I uh, the, uh, do have— ooh. I forgot about something. It is pretty... While well, you're looking for that, I'll tell people listening at home. It is pretty cool because you can see the uh, indication of where the railway bed was um, across the fields. If you go to you know Google Earth and you look at Gettysburg and you go down to the area of the Bliss Farm... Um, I, I would say find the Kadori Farm... And then move north-ish along the Emmitsburg Road, and eventually you're going to see the indication of an intersection at a, a quite an acute angle. Acute is smaller, right? Yes. And um, if you if you then zoom out with your eye focused on there, you'll see that it kind of just kind of cuts across the battlefield. Is that the one that went behind uh, the round tops, like along the Tawnytown Road? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same one. Okay. That's pretty cool. That's pretty neat. I love that stuff. Now, the, the only thing you can't see on Google Earth is where the damn pool was. <laughs> like, you would think that a pool would make a pretty, like, you know, recognizable maybe, indentation. Maybe the pool wasn't that big. I don't know. But why is it such a mystery as to where the pool was? I don't know why people care so much. Well, because it's just so crazy. <laughs> the idea of a swimming pool... On I, the battlefield. I, I mean, the home sweet home motel. Was, yeah, yeah, I know. And Stuckies. And, yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. Can go, you can go traipsing around looking for ghosts of <laughs> tourism past all you want. <laughs> ghosts yeah. of tourism past. Yeah. All right. One of the other things that I wanted to point out is that during the uh, War Department years, uh, the first monumentation to be on that part of the field is going to be done by the 14th Connecticut. Okay. And this was very common at the time. The uh, the regiments would go, or the reunion, or not the reunion, the regimental associations would go to the farmers and say, we want to buy a little square of your property so that we could set up the monument. Right. Okay? So they're going to, 14th Connecticut is going to actually have two uh, purchases, purchases, if you will. And this is going to be in, I think, 1884. Um, I don't know, the 1884, 1885-ish, uh, 1884. And they buy this, this property to set up the, the monuments out there. And if you've ever been out there, you're going to see uh, these square markers that say 14th CT on them. They're pretty chewed up from the different mowers <laughs> over the years, okay? But nonetheless, those were the property boundaries at the time. Kind of like we see with, uh -huh. North Carolina. with the North Carolina. Yeah. yeah. So this was the same thing there. However... During the War Department years, uh, the uh, they're going to wind up pulling those out of the ground, and the uh, 
Uh, Park Service is going to wind up putting them back. This is uh, from Frederick Tilburg. He's going to wind up putting him, them back where they think they should be. Uh-huh. Okay, So they may be close to the right spot, but maybe not exactly where the 14th Connecticut originally had them. But it is still one of those, still, those cool things. Yeah, that is cool. Yeah. It, is, is that their monument on the left? There? It's um, n- the one. No, that that's New, that's that's New, New Jersey. Jersey. Oh, okay. The uh, the one that's closest to the barn is the 14th Connecticut. Okay, so this one on, here on the right. Yes, that's okay. the, that's the 14th, and of course their main monument is uh, on Cemetery Ridge. Yeah. I just wanted to show the tank picture again. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, what else did I have here? And by the way, for those of you who are just listening on your uh, respective uh, chosen podcast app, um, there is a, a video version of this on YouTube that you can uh, watch and see the visuals that we're referring to if, if you're so interested. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't spend so much time talking about pictures that you couldn't see. We right. are much more professional than that, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a little bit. All right, so not too much. The other thing that I wanted to do was to make. Sh- do you want to go to the, um, the the question part? Yeah. Well, what we'll do is, if you're done with the story of uh, the Bliss Farm and everything like that, we're going to take a break. Okay. And then we'll uh, we'll come back and we'll get to everybody's questions. Don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to ask questions on Ask a Gettysburg Guide, you have to be a patron. Um, and uh, we're oh, we're around 300 p- or so patrons now, so uh, that's pretty cool. But uh, we need more. More patrons means more stuff for you. Um, patreoncom slash addressing Gettysburg. We'll be right back after these words. Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center, Gettysburg's premier museum, is housed in the historic Lutheran Seminary building constructed in 1832, a witness to the first day of battle. The museum's three floors of exhibits connect visitors to the dilemmas that led to the Civil War, provide a powerful and personal view of the battle's first day, and explore one of the battlefield's largest hospitals. No visit to Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center is complete without a guided tour of the building's famous cupola, where on the eve of battle, officers and civilians saw thousands of Confederate soldiers' campfires burning to the west, and Brigadier General John Buford watched for vital federal reinforcements as fighting erupted on the morning of July 1st. Today, you can stand where Buford stood and discover how this view helped chart the course of the Battle of Gettysburg. Your trip to Gettysburg is not complete without a serious visit to Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center, Gettysburg's premier museum. Purchase tickets online at seminaryridgemuseum.org or call 717-339-1300. Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center. It began here. There's a devil to pay. Our friends at the Association of Licensed Battlefield Guides want to see you at their 2022 Fall Seminar on September 23rd through 25th. This year's topic is Hancock's Second Corps at Gettysburg with a full weekend of education and social activities devoted to General Hancock and his Corps. The Licensed Battlefield Guides have some superb Second Corps themed battlefield tours lined up for you, including Attack of the Irish Brigade, Caldwell Strikes the Wheat Field, and more. On top of that, there will be a Friday night speaker and dinner at the Dobbin House, Saturday night cigars at the Rupp House, maps, and other extras. And if that wasn't good enough, how about this? Special hotel room rates are available for you at the 1863 Inn of Gettysburg, but you gotta make sure that you reserve a room before August 9th. Register for the tours on the ALBG website at gettysburgtourguides.org slash ALBG seminar. Those dates again are September 23rd through 25th. Come and learn about Hancock and the Second Corps with your favorite licensed battlefield guides and fellow Gettys nerds. We hope to see you there. You've heard us promote various ways that you can help us keep the show going. But one way we haven't pushed too much yet is our sutlery at addressinggettysburg.com slash shop. And that's a shame, because we have designs over there by talented artists like Ty DeWitt of 1863 Designs and Mike Stretch of the Heritage Depot. So now we're promoting it. Buying shirts, hoodies, mugs, and other items from our sutlery not only helps us keep the lights on, but it also helps guys like Ty and Mike, and it helps spread the word about the show every time you wear an item or sip from your mug. So please, head over to addressinggettysburg.com slash shop and grab some merch. You just might find the perfect Christmas gift for the Gettys nerd in your family. That's addressinggettysburg.com slash shop. 
Gettysburg, a nation divided mobile app is relaunching this summer. Gettysburg, a nation divided is an award winning mixed reality mobile application using augmented reality technology. It transports users into the most crucial moments in the Battle of Gettysburg, the turning point of the Civil War. Users can listen and watch historic figures share their stories as lifelike animated avatars, traverse 360 degree image sequences of the battlefield. Its cinematic battle sequences are narrated by actor Scott Eastwood. The mobile app is available for free on iOS and Android. It's designed to be used anywhere, at home, at school, at the park, or at Gettysburg National Military Park. It uses GPS to help guide you through your journey to see the stories and events unfold at the exact location where they occurred. So go into your phone's app store and get it now for free. That's Gettysburg, a nation divided. Hey folks, you know, one of the most popular episodes on our Patreon feed isn't even about the Battle of Gettysburg. No, it's actually about the Battle of the Little Bighorn. The Battle of the Little Bighorn rivals Gettysburg as the most written about and debated battle in American history. If you ever wanted a chance to visit or revisit this iconic battlefield in southeastern Montana, then now is your chance. Join historian and friend of the show, James Hessler, on his annual Little Bighorn tour. This year's travel dates are August 31st through September 5th of 2022. You will follow Custer's route to the battlefield, see where the fight opened in the Little Bighorn Valley, and visit key battlefield landmarks such as Reno Hill, Weir Point, and Last Stand Hill. While touring the field, you will debate all the many controversies that continue to surround Custer and this battle. This is a great opportunity to see one of the most pristine and historic battlefields in the country. Those dates again are August 31st through September 5th, 2022. And for more details, email Jim at Custer7 at Comcast.net. That's Custer, the numeral 7, at Comcast.net. Put Little Bighorn 2022 addressing Gettysburg in the subject line. But don't delay. This trip will book up very soon. You're listening to the Addressing Gettysburg podcast with Matt Callery. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. And we are going to ask some questions submitted by our patrons who so kindly joined over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. And they've been with us for years. And we thank them very much. And we thank you in advance for hearing this and saying, you know what? I'm going to be a patron too. So thank you so much. And uh, we're going to start off here with Stephen Lunsford. Um, He says, who exactly burned the Bliss Farm? There seems to be a couple of regiments slash persons of the Second Corps that claim credit. I always thought it was a regiment of Smythe's Brigade, but recently came across the account of Sergeant Hitchcock of the 111th New York, who was volunteered to burn it. I'm sure you will have covered much of this on the episode, but just looking for some addition, uh, added clarification. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, okay. Okay. So we talked about uh, Sergeant Hitchcock. Yes. Um, who are the, these other people? The added the well. Here's your added uh, clarification, if you will. Sergeant Hitchcock is going to be one of the volunteers who goes out there with the order. Of course, he's going to wind up taking some fire supplies with him, so he may be part of that. However, it's just one guy. The ones who actually burn the uh, the house and the barn is going to be the 14th Connecticut once they receive the order from Sergeant Hitchcock and. Park Postles, who winds up getting there about the same mm-hmm. time, it seems. Okay. Okay. So that's where, as far as other people taking uh, credit for it, I don't really know of anybody else taking credit for it, other than it's a little bit muddy on how the order actually gets out there. But both the 111th, Sergeant Hitchcock, and 1st Delaware, who's a staff officer for uh, Colonel Smythe, go out there with the order. To give to Major okay. Ellis. So it's a team effort. Yeah, it seems to be a team <clears throat> effort. Okay. Brian Sullivan says, why was the Bliss Farm used to train tanks in World War I, and was this training the reason Eisenhower eventually had his farm at Gettysburg? Yes, we did cover this one a little bit as well. Again, U.S. War Department is in charge of the battlefield at that time, and the... Um, The U.S. War Department, as far as um, that goes, they're going to use other Civil War battlefields for training grounds and for camps and all that sort of thing. It's not just Gettysburg. And they happen to use it here. Uh, Captain, I think Eisenhower was only a captain at Mm -hmm. that time. And he winds up getting in charge of the camp. And yes, that is whenever he, that's his first exposure to the town, the area, and of course the battlefield. And the women. And the women. I don't know. That, no, I've heard no, rumors. He was, no, I thought he was married already. No, he was, but... 
No, no, no. Rumors. There'll be none of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the great Trinetti, he wants to know. He says, I was wondering what happened to the owners, occupants of the farm during and after the battle, seeing as they were uh, obviously unable to return home. So we, we went over this before, but I, I'll kind of rephrase this question. Um, when they came back and saw that everything was gone, do we know... Did they stay here for a while? Yeah, they did. They, stay, did. they did stay here for a while. They're going to wind up, uh, as far as we know, just staying in town with friends or are renting a place in town. He's trying to get, you know, the the compensation from the government. Never happens. Winds up selling the uh, property at a loss, of course. And then he goes back to uh, upstate New York where they're going to live out the rest of their days. Uh-huh. Okay. Brian Duranik says, how did the back and forth action of the Bliss Farm impede, impede Carnot Posey's? Is it Carnot or Carno? Um, I've, I've, I've heard it both ways, yeah. if you will. Carno sounds too fancy. Uh, Posey's uh, Mississippi Brigade from fully supporting the left of Ambrose Wright's Georgia Brigade and its momentary breakthrough on Cemetery Ridge on the evening of July 2nd. So did the back and forth of the Bliss Farm impede that for Posey? Um, yeah, but it's going to be more of a uh, commander's failure, if you will. We touched on this between Anderson and Pender, whose parts of both divisions, their brigades are going to be involved in this. Uh, we talked about how that A.P. Hill, who's the overall commander, is kind of absent in these uh, operations, if you will. And then... Uh, the way that uh, Anderson winds up giving um, this tactical, this situation on the ground at the Bliss Farm where he kind of has Posey really get hung up around there. So they don't actually wind up going forward. And then Mahone never supports Posey, which is why Posey gives the reason for not going forward. And then we're going to have the other part, last part of that. Whenever the that in an echelon, for lack of a better word, is is moving uh, towards it. You're going to have more Union skirmishers go further out to even past where we have the. Um, think of where the backside of uh, Pickett's Buffet is right now. Mm -hmm. So you got Union skirmishers, decent skirmish line, multiple regiments all the way out there, are facing off against Confederates in Long Lane, and of course even. They're going to be on the uh, left flank of Posey's men who wind up being in the Bliss Farm at that point in time. So it winds up being the, that holdup, if you will. <coughs> but the biggest thing is you have no overall commander is what I would track it down to. Okay. And I think the biggest thing there, uh, since Anderson is kind of hands off or seems to be lost, uh, AP Hill must have serious uh, medical things going on, and uh, <laughs> and uh, who's the other one? Oh, Pender gets gets a gash out of his leg from an artillery shell. It, yeah, it's really remarkable how the uh, Third Corps is just kind of it's like every man for himself. There's no organization. Yeah, it's, and it's a breakdown at the at the upper le levels of leadership. Now Anderson was never a. Um, He's never known to be one of those uh, gallant leaders, if you will. So I think that's a big part of it. Yeah, it sounds kind of like he was a, a dud. It, it, well, certainly certainly for here. I had, a, I had a description about him. What did I say about him? Major Richard Heron Anderson, 42. <laughs> He's from South Carolina, a wealthy uh, plantation society guy. West Point, near the bottom of his class, did well in the Mexican War, stationed to Carlisle. Marries Sarah Gibson. Oh, she's the, this is the one who she's he's he is married to uh, a daughter of a Supreme Court justice. Okay. Okay. And he's a brave, prudent, and intelligent officer, but not necessarily aggressive enough, <coughs> as we have seen. Excuse me. Well, there you go. Mm -hmm. Um. <coughs> Got a bit of a tickle in me throat. Uh, Patrick Maddy says, are there any known photos of the Bliss Farm? I'm assuming he means from uh, before the battle right. and before it was burnt. Do we do we have any? We we do not, but we do have uh, two paintings. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> of course, not a photo. Uh, one, we, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have a better one. I don't even want to use this. 
Yeah. Did you find? Did you happen to find this, Eric? The cover of the Fury on the Bliss Farm. Did you find no, that? Okay, so we'll one. show it here. Okay, yeah, not a good one. I wasn't able to find a good one either. John Archer, by the way, uh, one of my colleagues had done a this book on uh, Fury at, at the Bliss Farm here, or on the Bliss Farm, and what he uses on his cover is a uh, painting that was found. We believe that it was done somewhere around 1866. However, 1866, these buildings did not exist. So what would have been described to the uh, painter is uh, what we see there. The style that you have there is very similar, or might even be Leo Frankenstein, who had done other. It's Frankenstein. <laughs> Walk this way, okay. <laughs> <laughs> now we believe that that's who, uh, or it seems to be who painted that, because the style is exactly the same that uh, that uh, Frankenstein has uh, <laughs> pa- <laughs> painted on other parts of the battlefield. So I want to show everybody these buildings here. You may be going, what are these buildings? That's that's the Bryan Farm. Right. So this is the Emmitsburg. That okay. Br- on the Bryan Farm. That that's important. Where you're you're right. Uh, Right no, there. wait, these are the, this is the Bryan farm buildings as we know them today, or are these the tenant buildings down at the bottom the of the property? The, the one that you're pointing to right now is the tenant building. Right, so we're okay. up here on Hancock Avenue, because right. there's the wall. Right, right. Right, all right, and we're looking out, and then there's the, the barn, uh, and then the house. ridge, and all that stuff. That's hard to do backwards. I know. <laughs> it's like okay. your, your brain's going to snap. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it snapped years ago. <laughs> Uh, okay, and then that one, and then and you've this got... And this one here is, is pretty impressive. Actually, Eric, you have this one, I think, the painting. Yeah. So I might have a better version, because this was like a... Uh, what, what's what's the bigger... Uh, this oh, is a, no, that's a pretty good version. Oh, no, that is a pretty yeah. good version. Okay, All so right. there's that's we'll Dale Gallon that. there. You can get you can get a hold of that, uh, folks, if you uh, contact them at gallon.com. Mm-hmm. That is it's, a nice painting. It's, I think I think it's very nice. It from all the descriptions, uh, Gallon I think does pretty good research before he does uh, uh, paintings, especially on stuff that is no longer existent on the battlefield. Mm-hmm. And so he takes information from all those sources. He goes out there. He's going to line up the ground, and what we see there. Uh, facing us along that fence line is the 14th Connecticut. Keep in mind, obviously, this is right after they set the buildings on fire. They are still gathering up their wounded uh, and their dead, as well as a bunch of chickens and I'm sure some other farm animals as well. And they're going to be leaving the field. But those guys who we see at the fence line, the 14th Connecticut, they're going to be sparring off against those Confederates on their picket line who are in the uh, Long Lane area. That would be Thomas's Georgians and Perrin's South Carolina. That's who's going to be over there. Right. They're firing into Colt Park. Yes. Basically. Yes, that's exactly what those guys are doing. Okay. Okay. I think that's a pretty good description there. Um, One thing that this painting doesn't show that I think would be, I guess you'd have to have a really big painting, because I can't stress enough how important that 10-acre orchard, which would have been behind behind those two buildings there. Behind the outhouse. Yes. The the orchard would be behind the outhouse there uh, on the Seminary Ridge side, and that was absolutely critical (laughs) that the uh, Confederates are going to use it throughout the whole two days, plus even afterwards until they finally get off this battlefield. Mm. Nice painting. Yes. I paint, and I wish I could paint like that. You can't? I, I can't do people. Oh. Uh, no. That's a problem if they, you want to do something like that. They look like aliens when I try <laughs> to do them. Uh, and finally, Rick Scarce, he says, has the Park Service ever considered marking key battlefield buildings that no longer exist in some sort of three-dimensional way? I have in mind simple water steel framing that would give visitors a sense of what actually uh, was there but allow them to see through those structures to enjoy the views we now have. Marking the Bliss Farm uh, home and barn, Rogers home, Klingel home, well, Klingel is still there, Forney home and farm and McPherson home, for example, in a way that gives the folks a sense of size of those key buildings and the tactical advantages and challenges that came with them would be helpful in understanding and interpreting the battlefield as it was fought on, wouldn't it? Oh, Rick, I agree with you, but Rick... You are barking up the wrong tree, my friend, because that is a great idea. And you know that great ideas die when the government gets a hold of them. (laughs) So that's never going to happen. But go ahead, Rick. What do you think about that? Okay. Uh, Okay. My name's... I said that... I'm sorry. Your name name is Mike. (laughs) Rick is the guy. And by the way, that's what I said, not Mike. (laughs) 
Um, I will say this, and I have, uh, when I take folks out, this is often a difficult. Missing buildings do make the whole visualization process a little bit hard for, for some people. Yeah. Um, however, uh, I remember this being brought up in the past, and as far as I know, the National Park Service has no plans to do anything like this. Number one, money, money involved. Money. Number two, it's going to need that perpetual care, mm-hmm. okay? The Park Service is against anything that's going to have to do with perpetual care, okay? That's the thing I think a lot of people don't realize is it's one thing to get the money to do it, but what about the money to maintain it? Mm-hmm. And if you get that money from an outside source, like some rich guy's like, I want you to clear to Culp's Hill. Yeah. Well, okay, how are we going to maintain that unless you've set up some kind of a fund that will make it so that we can afford to do it? Otherwise, it's just going to go back to whatever yes. nature wants yes. it to be. And I'll say this, too. Um, if you This was done. Uh, also, you guys might be familiar with uh, Bren, Ben Franklin's home in Philadelphia. They mm-hmm. did do this. Mm-hmm. They did the outline of steel with the building. And you can, you can help visualize exactly where that is. Um, however... In comparison to the rest of the landscape, it does look kind of odd, you know. So well, right, because it's it's a little it's modern. It's too it's too it's too straight. Yeah, yeah it's well, too right, straight. You're, right. you, of course, you're going to get the idea of the size and all that sort of thing. But then, whenever you combine with the the main the maintenance, and I think that I think those buildings would do more to obstruct than to compliment. Although I understand I what you're saying from that tactical part. Yeah, this yeah. is okay, we could see that. They moved around this way. They had to go to the left. They had to go to the right. So it would help you with that sort of stuff, but um, maybe just another reason to know even more about this battle. Yeah, and, and to get out there and explore on your own. You know, mm-hmm. go go to the site of the Bliss Farm and see where the foundations are and mm-hmm. try to figure out what it might have looked like and you know, it's not easy. No, it's not. But, I mean, you can get a better sense of it when you go there. Um, yeah, I think you got to do that is just go and, and do it. I think the thing is, um, and rightfully so, the Park Service is um, uh, not keen on things that will make this place f- look or feel like an amusement park. Am mm-hmm. I correct in saying that? I, th- I think so. I think, yeah. Yeah, that makes and, sense. And... Uh, and so to do something like that, and I know what you're, I know what you're talking about. I've seen these things that you're talking about. So it, it's not something that I would equate with an amusement park, but it's like you said, it's, it's not natural it's to not the nat- landscape. It doesn't look right. Bingo, that's it. Right. And there. so that will kind of give it a different feel than what I think that they really want to go for. And I don't blame them for that. I, I don't. I don't think. I think that the beauty of the battlefield that we have today, as opposed to what other generations had before us, is that uh, we we have a lot of stuff that has been removed that shouldn't have ever been there in the first place. But mm-hmm. because of you know right. ownership of property, it was. Well, the, the War Department did some of that. I mean, look at the sure. look at the Forney Farm. That's something that could have been preserved. They tore that down, and yeah. then uh, uh, well, that whole the whole middle school area. Which I think, oh. I know, like, you know, oh, what about the children? And yeah, screw them. I think <laughs> it's say an ab- that. Well, I, you know, forget about them. <laughs> I, I just think, no, I think it's an abomination that the, the government traded that property there. And yeah. I mean, that's horrible. Yeah. That's horrible. But well, look at the, look at the, Gettysburg College with the uh, oh, the, the cut that's there. another thing. Yeah. The college, yeah. So there's always been shady deals. There's always been stupid deals. And you know, I mean, look, ladies and gentlemen, if only every generation before us was as brilliant as we are. Okay, and if they if they knew that we were all going to be born and blame them for all of our problems, I mean, you know, they would have acted differently. But they thought that we would have been mature adults about things. <laughs> Little did they know. Um, so, yeah, so I don't know. I think that would be neat to have some kind of visual representation of things that weren't there anymore, but that's asking a little much. Yeah. Get the park into private hands where, you know, mm-hmm. that then that's a different story, but that'll never happen, yeah. and I don't want that to happen. Yeah, that'll I don't happen. want it to turn to Disney World. All right, so that's that. Did you want to say about um, this? Yeah, so the next thing, um, the last thing is books on this because uh, this is not something that is, you know, widely known or there's not a ton of books out there. Right, because there are no buildings. Because there are no buildings (laughs) and and nobody even knows it's there. But here's one that we were showing you before, Furia on the Bliss Farm at Gettysburg. 
by John M. Archer. Yes, another and guide this, here at Gettysburg, by the way. I think I've seen this uh, at um, uh, for the historian. Yeah, yeah. The, and, um, and you can get I, your I will say there. this: John Archer's book does go into a lot more uh, detail on his take on how. Uh, Posey getting hung up at the Bliss Farm affects Wright's advance. Okay. Okay. So he does do a little bit more detail on that. All right. So if you're interested in that, that's what you want to go and look at. And then this one here. And this is the struggle for the Bliss Farm at Gettysburg, July 2nd and 3rd, 1863, over a wide, hot Crimson Plain mm -hmm. by Elwood Christ. Oh, there, Eric's got that. Okay, yeah. good. And uh, and that one is harder to find, Much or harder was to harder find. to find, Until but Savis Beatty put it out again. Yes. And it's available on Amazon. It's, I don't think it's, they don't do Amazon, do they? Oh, I just saw it on Amazon. Oh, okay. Yeah, I looked it up before. And it, uh, uh, I don't think it's for the historian. I don't, or maybe it is. I'll have to find out. Okay, well, it's, call and ask it's, it's like brand new. Yeah, okay. yeah, right. It just came out not too long ago. So and, those are, and Hessler has a... Blur. Oh, yeah. Jim Hessler has a foreword in, uh, in that book there, the Savas Beatty version. So um, get a hold of that. Amazon, you can definitely find it on Amazon. Soft cover, it was like 30 bucks, I think. So uh, okay. not bad. And I remember when soft covers were like $9.99. I know. Yeah. That was not too long ago. No. I mean, yeah, a book like this is uh, 40 50 bucks. Yeah. 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 So. Back in the old days. Uh, Mike, thank you very much for coming on. I hope it wasn't too very traumatizing welcome. for no, you. No, not okay. at all. Good. It, it was fun. Good. Uh, hopefully you'll come back again. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> um, and uh, thank you all for listening. And please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to us on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Obviously, you're listening already, so you're doing it. Anyway, turn those notifications on, and please consider becoming a patron today at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. And until next time, have a good one. All right. You are free to go now, Mike. All right. Wow. Okay. That was uh, that was an experience. Yes, it was. <laughs> are you a reenactor or living historian? Or maybe you're a War of Rights player and want to bring esprit de corps to your team. Well, then you need the Badge Maker, the leading provider of Civil War and other historical badges and insignias. Mention this ad with an attached message in your order and receive a free surprise gift. I myself bought a metal second core badge and it always starts a conversation when I wear it. So hit up the badge maker at civilwarcorebadges.com. Something for everyone and anyone. Our hearts so stout have got a stain for suit is known from whence we came. Wherever we go, they dread the name of Gary Owen and glory. Instead, it's follow, drink down and pain.